Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? Yes, Your Honor. The defendant will rise and The jury, after due and careful consideration, find the defendant, Dr. Robert Cromwell, not guilty of the crime with which he is charged. <laughs> the court feels that it is the high office of physicians and surgeons to preserve life, not to take it. Defendant, Dismissed. Now, where will this lead? Are doctors going to be allowed the lives of incurable invalids? You know, as I take it, this verdict of a surgeon a legal right to perform an operation that he knows will be fatal. <laughs> now, that's a clever way of committing murder. He might do it for uh, experimental purposes or for other sentimental reasons or to make and get away with it. Them doctor steals bodies from the graveyard, don't they, sir? They sure does, sir. Yes? Get hold of Miss Porter. She's interviewing Jacob Turner's widow at the Turner home. See if she's back. All right. To get down to brass tacks, we guessed this verdict wrong. Uh -uh. Personally, I'm glad Cromwell is free. Well, Judge Lewis doesn't agree with you. And the public certainly doesn't. The verdict should have been guilty. Cromwell murdered Jacob Turner. Hmm. If I'd been Turner, I'd welcome the chance to be cured or killed. But there wasn't any chance. That's just what my point. Yes? Miss Porter to speak to Mr. Burke. Put her on. <clears throat> Hello. Did you get to Mrs. Turner? Uh, yes, Mr. Burke. She denies that she's in love with Dr. Cromwell, but I got her to admit that she admires him. Good girl. Now I want you to interview Cromwell. But he won't talk. That's why I'm sending you. Make him talk. Everyone else failed. Find out why he performed this operation. The real reason. All about it. Hop to it. Dr. Cromwell comes in before Dr. Lucas. I'm dying to see him. Morbid curiosity, my dear. Ever been operated on? No, never. I've been operated on times. Really? Twelve stitches each time. What do you think about that? I think I'd put in a zipper. <laughs> Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. Has Cromwell come in? No, Doctor. That's strange. I left him at the Medical Association more than an hour ago. What is the Association going to do about it, Doctor? Hard to say. Did you appear before the committee? Yes, yes. I brought up the point that no one is wise enough to say that because this operation never has been successfully performed, it never will be. Finally, that Cromwell is one of the most brilliant of our young surgeons. 
and his services should not be lost because of this public hue and cry. However, a doctor shouldn't take such a long chance when the patient is as prominent as Jacob Turner. You remember I advised Cromwell against operating. Send Miss Johnson in. Very well. You may come in now, Miss Johnson. Oh, Miss, can you tell me when Dr. Cromwell will come in? I'm sorry, but I can't. He's at a meeting of the Medical Association. Why are all these people ahead of me? To see Dr. Cromwell. Oh. I wonder if there's a private phone that I could use. Uh, may I use the one in here? Why, yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cromwell or Dr. Lucas? Oh, Dr. Lucas, of course. I want to be cured, don't I, Queenie? And not killed. <laughs> Good afternoon, Doctor. Oh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Yes, I will, thank you. Oh, you're a very nice nurse, said I. Might use this phone. Quite all right. How did you hurt your arm? I fell. I was getting out of my car. I see. Donald Evans, your instructor, phoned from the airport to congratulate you on the verdict. Also, he wants to arrange for your final test. I'll telephone him later. I'm awfully happy about the verdict. Thank you, Miss Fielding. Have you had an x-ray taken of your arm, Miss, uh, Miss Porter? Uh, no, I haven't. But I'm sure it isn't broken. Well, suppose I look at it. Oh, I wonder if you'd wait a minute. I feel a little faint. Certainly. Oh, silly of me. Would you like a drink of water? Oh, I'll be all right in a few minutes. Doctor. You seem awfully upset. May I prescribe for you before you prescribe for me? Well, what would you prescribe? Well, when I'm worried, I get rid of it by talking it out of myself. Of course, I know why you're worried. I've been reading the things they've said about you in the newspapers. They aren't true, are they, Doctor? No, not all of them. The newspapers infer that you performed this operation on Jacob Turner because you were in love with Mrs. Turner. I've never been in love. I performed the operation because I believed that it would prove successful. Now you know you're wrong. Oh, the operation was a success. But the patient died. Yes, if you wish to phrase it that way. Well, how is it? Very simply. It was something like this. His left arm was paralyzed. Certain nerves of his face were affected, causing his, his right eyelid to droop. His condition was caused by a tumor on that part of the brain known as the pons. And it was the opinion of the physicians who had attended him that such a tumor cannot be removed. That is, the respiratory, that which makes us breathe, centers back here. And therefore, under the knife, the patient stops breathing. The result is immediate death. That was and is their contention. But 
Turner didn't die under the knife. That's my point. He didn't die until five hours after the operation had been performed. The tumor was successfully removed. Further, I say the operation was a success because before his death, the nerves of his face showed signs of recovery and the paralysis was partly relieved. I think I see what you mean. But why did he die? I contend that he died because his vitality had been drained by the length of his illness. Had this operation been performed six months or a year ago, I'm sure he would have lived. Well, I think I understand. Someday, someone will perform a similar operation. He'll save a human life. That will be my vindication. I hope so. But I'm wondering, suppose the relation between you and Turner had been closer than patient and doctor, would you have taken the chance? That's a question I can't answer. No one can say how far his judgment may be swayed by his emotions. Uh, shall I have a look at your arm now? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Why? Well, there's nothing the matter with your arm. No. Oh, I hope you believe me. I'd rather have it broken than confess. I was sent here to interview you. Oh, I'm so sorry. You wouldn't give out any interviews. Are there uh, any patients waiting to see me? No, doctor. Well, didn't I have some appointments? Mrs. Brooks and Mrs. Taylor canceled their appointments. I see. Miss Fielding, I'm giving up this office. Please have my name taken from the door. But doctor, the medical association hasn't passed on the case. Won't you wait? There's hardly any use waiting. The practice of a physician is based on public confidence. Apparently, I've lost that. You, uh, please see if you can get Donald Evans on the telephone. Very well. Hello? Oh, Evans? I'd like to arrange to make my final solo flight this afternoon. Yeah. That's right. Gosh, she's running fine. 
Looks fine, Don. What have you had done to it? Oh, give her a complete overhaul. <laughs> Going to do something with her. Yeah, another non-stop record, huh? No, no, no. Something bigger. And then you won't want me washing out your landing gear. Oh, no chance, Doc. Your nerves are okay. Hey, Don, your face is coming along all right. Oh, it's pretty good. I'll be glad when I get some teeth so I can talk like a human being again. You talk fine. Yeah, I'm glad you think so. Say, Don, uh, who owns that old crate over there? How's that? That belongs to the airport. You know, that used to be Nungesser's old ship. Really? Yeah. You know, sometimes when the fellas uh, get too many under them and don't care what happens to them, they take it up for a hop. <laughs> yeah? I never noticed it before. Let's take a look at it. All right. You know, I'd like to try her out. Whatever gave you that notion, Doc? What's that? Hey, whatever gave you the idea of taking this old can out? Well, I'm going to be a pilot. I should be able to fly any ship, shouldn't I? Say, uh, things that bad, Don? What do you mean, Don? I mean, it's so bad that you want to take this up and fly the wings off of it. Now, you look here. I've been in the same sort of a fix you're in. I sort of, I sort of understand the way you feel about it. You know, I was stunning for a flying circus, and I killed a man. They were going to take my license away. Then I jumped into another ship, went up, and broke the existing speed record at that time. Then instead of taking away my license, they were pinning medals on me. You get what I'm driving at, Doc? No, I'm afraid I don't, Don. Just this. Doc, people soon forget. You know, the public's awful fickle. They, they forget right away. You want to you wanna give them something... Something new to think about. Of course, if you want to, if you want to fluff things, it's all right. But I got a better proposition. I've been, I've been thinking about it for a year. I've been working on it for the last four or five months. And now I'm about set to go. In fact, I'll be shoving off in about a week or so. Look here. Take a look at this map. It's a, it's a Tokyo flight. You see, we start from here. Go up. Across here into Alaska, and then, and then follow this line right down the Aleutian Islands into Japan. I've got to have somebody go along with me. How about it, Doc? By George, I'll go. A new land. It'll be a chance to start all over again. Great. You've taken enough navigation under me. You can help me out on the navigation, you see? Now... Don, hey, look at this. This means I'll have to find a new land and start all over. Send-off, pal. You wait. Tomorrow they'll wake up and find your name written clear across the sky all the way from the USA to Japan. You'll feel just as cheap as I did once when I was in Paris during the war. A Frenchman tried to get into a cab that I just hailed in the curb, but I beat him to it and I got in first. Then I give him the raspberry. <laughs> you know? You know? The next day I was presented to him with a crowd of gear. He was the president of France. <laughs> Don't worry with me, Doc. First is, what new land are you going to? I haven't decided yet. What else is worrying you? What's in that black bag that you brought along back there? Well, what would you guess? <laughs> I guess two dress suits for us to wear at the ambassador's dinner tomorrow night in Tokyo. <laughs> Gosh, Doc, it's, it's getting thick as a devil. 
I can't seem to get out of this. You see any good place to land down there? Well, I've seen better landing fields. for better company, Don. Well, we're going to have to land. Brace yourself, Doc. Heavens. Don. Are you all right? Heavens. You Vundag, Tom Ross is bringing in a frozen man. You better get a room ready. Bring him here, please. It's warm in here. Be careful. Don't drop it. Don't hurt him. 
You'd better rub him with some snow, Seth. He's not frozen, he's hurt. Get him out of his clothes and into bed. Yeah. Oh, Tom, you'd better organize a searching party. There might have been somebody else with him. That's a good idea. <clears throat> Sadie. I didn't mean to neglect you so today, but I've been kind of busy and worried. Well, young man, it's getting pretty late. 9.30. And Tom isn't back with the boys yet. Gosh, I hope nothing's happened to them. Pretty bad out, Klondike? Yes, it is. I'm afraid we're going to be snowed in all right. Where did that man come from? I don't know. That's what the men are trying to find out. I'll ask him if he ever wakes up. Feeling all right? Mm hmm I'll go and get Mark. Mark, it's Jim's bedtime. Mark. Well, I'd hate to be sick and depend upon you to stay awake. What time is it? It's 9.30. I wonder I went to sleep. Boys come back yet? No, and I'm worried. You better go and put Jim to bed if you can get him to go before the news item comes on. I'll stay and watch. It's all right. You're at Armstrong's trading post. Where's that? In the Klondike. Klondike? And that's my name, too. Oh. Hmm. Who are you and where did you come from? We have a special news item concerning the Tokyo Flyers. Donald Evans and Dr. Robert Cromwell, who are now several hours overdue at Seward, Alaska. Their plane was last seen flying low over Vancouver at 9 o'clock this morning. Due to prevailing winds, it is feared they may have been blown off their course towards the interior. Interest has been heightened in this flight because of the fact that Evans' co-pilot, Dr. Cromwell, a surgeon of this city, was acquitted recently after a sensational trial which centered around the death of Jacob Turner, a wealthy and incurable invalid. You're one of those men, aren't you? Yes. You're Donald Evans. Why, why do you think I am Evans? Because I don't think you'd kill a man. We listened to that trial because we were interested on account of Jim. Jim? Yes, Jim Armstrong. He's afflicted the same way that old man Jacob Turner was, who was killed by that doctor. Oh, they're coming back. Who? The searching party. Oh, um. Found an airplane smashed to pieces, half buried in the snow. There was a man in it, dead. We did what was necessary, no need of bringing him in. There were two of them. One was Donald Evans. He's the one's in there. The other, Dr. Cromwell. I'm glad. I'm glad he's dead. He killed that old man and now he's dead. Good night, Jim. And the president has agreed to meet the Senate committee Monday at 2 p.m. from San Francisco. All hope has been given up for the Tokyo Flyers, six days having elapsed since they were last seen flying low over Vancouver. The next news broadcast will be at 9.30 p.m. You know, it gives me the creep to hear those news items. 
And with no way of letting the world know that you're here and Dr. Cromwell's dead. Yes, I know. I, I just heard the radio. How long will it be before we can get word through? Oh, maybe a week or two. You know, six days of sleet and snow. I guess you brought it with you. There you are. Thank you. Oh, won't, uh, won't you sit down? No, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to you really yet. All right. Will you have some toast with me? Oh, no, thanks. I've finished. What do you do with yourself through the long winters up here? Oh, I help Mark with the store and the cooking. But he's a much better cook than I am. Then I teach school, and of course, there's always Jim to look after. Uh, Tom Ross tells me that uh, you and Jim were to be married. Yes, Jim and I have been engaged ever since I can remember. We were going to get married and go down to the States. He had an awfully good job offered him down there. You know, he's really a genius. He can make anything electrical. Why, well, he made that radio out there, and it picks up stations from all over this part of the country. We were going away that summer, two summers ago. But then he was taken ill. Well, tell me, were you born up here? Oh, yes, we were both born up here. Our fathers were partners, so we were practically raised together. Oh, come on. Well, shall we start another game? Not a game. You haven't beaten me yet. I'm going to jump two of your men right now. Oh, I suppose that'll end it. Certainly it will. My, isn't that wonderful? Well, how do you like the looks of this? <laughs> Say, that isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why don't you me. use your eyes? And you're the little girl that always wanted to go to the States, eh? Oh, I wanted to go until Jim took sick. But why this way, of course, I wouldn't leave him. Suppose he were cured. Why, then we'd get married. Oh, I see. Well, how about this nice lollipop? Well, well haven't you got an A6 for a penny? Well, we've got this kind. Now, what do you want six for a penny for? Well, one for Jean, and one for Mama Claudette. Uh-huh, that makes two. One for Jean, and one for Papa Claudette. That makes four. There. One for Jean, and one for you. For me? Oh, dear. This was Jim's workshop. I want you to see it. I want to talk to you about Jim. All right, Mark. Dust. Just as he left it last time he was down here, two years ago this summer. Those are his books. He studied too hard. Maybe that's what's the matter. He always was smart. When he was just a boy and first heard of Mark Coney's experiments, turned right in and built a radio, the first in this part of the country. You're proud of him, aren't you, Mark? Yes, I am proud of him. I'd give the trading post. I'd give my own life to make him well like he was. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I listened to that trial over the radio, and I believed what that jury must have believed when they said you weren't guilty. I felt that you must have believed there was a chance to save that old man's life. 
And what I want to ask is, is there any chance to save Jim's life? The chance is very slight, Mark. But there is a chance. Yes, if the operation is performed soon enough. But I can't perform it. The boy isn't any good to himself. And he's fast growing worse. I've got to see him day after day, dying in front of my own eyes. And you are a doctor and won't do anything about it. Don't you see, I haven't any right to practice here or any place else. I'm Jim's father. And I ask you to do it. I'll stand the consequences. Mark, you don't understand. You can't stand the consequences. If I should operate on Jim and he should die, I'd be a murderer. I haven't any right to operate on anyone. He wouldn't die. You know you could cure him. I can read it in your eyes. Yes, Mark, I, I believe I could. But my hands are tied. I don't know how to say things except straight. You refuse to operate, and I'll tell you why. I've been watching you day after day with Klondike. And if Jim was cured, she'd marry him. Ain't that the real reason you won't operate? No, Mark. That has nothing to do with it. I think it's got a lot to do with it. Think it over. Why, Sadie? Well, are you? Well, do you look grand? <laughs> you like it? Why, what's the matter? I came to see that doctor. Now, that's too bad. Well, let me see. Uh, Jean's in there now, having his leg attended to. But you can just wait and go right in in a minute or two. Hey, Ma! Can I have a piece of candy? Didn't I tell you not to follow me over here? But I just wanted one piece of candy. <laughs> Mark? I've been telling that doctor he's got to cure Jim. Cure him? How? By operating, like he did on that man in the States. But, Mark, that man in the States died. Dr. Cromwell isn't going to operate on Jim. You're not in love with Dr. Cromwell, are you, Klondike? Why, Mark? What do you mean? Suppose Jim was cured. You'd feel you'd have to marry him, wouldn't you? Why, I'd give anything in the world to see Jim well again. Then you'll do what I ask. If he isn't cured, it won't be your fault, nor his. And Jim will be better off. What do you want me to do? I want you to get him to operate. But, Mark, you don't know what you're asking. Supposing Jim dies. He won't die. He'll get well. All right. I'll talk to Dr. Cromwell. When? Oh, when I get a chance. Maybe tonight. All right. I, I don't believe he can possibly live six months. Maybe a year at the longest. But just suppose you cured him. Suppose I did cure him. Klondike, do you love Jim? Yes. I love him as I've always loved him. And if I cured him, you'd marry him? Yes. Suppose I failed. 
Oh, but I don't believe you'd fail. Or I wouldn't ask you. No. No, I wouldn't fail. Not if that's what you want. Operate, the better are Jim's chances of recovery. Then you are going to operate? Yes. Tonight. Mark, you'd better sit down. They can take care of him. You'd better go in the other room.
One thing is certain. The greatest danger has passed. Due to Jim's remarkable vitality, the respiratory action didn't stop during the operation. What does that mean, Doc? He didn't stop breathing. Oh. The effect of the anesthetic is worn off. He's breathing normally. Temperature's gone down. Is he going to get well, Doctor? See no reason why he shouldn't. Look, his hand seems to be relaxed already. Oh, it's wonderful. No. No, it just proves that an operation like this can be performed successfully. Mark! Mark! Uh -huh. Mark, uh -huh. Jim's going to get well. Uh, well? Yes. Jim, well? Jim. Oh, shh. Quiet. Everything's going to be all right, Mark. Supposing you come and get a little rest now. He's cured, Doctor. Yes, Mark. I guess you're pretty tired, Doc. I want to tell you, I never seen a man in a harder spot than you was last night. One slip of the knife and you'd have had what I reckon you want more than all the gold in the Klondike. What do you mean, Tom? Oh, I ain't blind, Doc. And there ain't no man that's ever seen Klondike that could blame you. What I admire you for most is the way you handle them tools and her standing beside you. Well, I can see you now by the table, working to save Jim's life when, if I know what's what, you're mighty deep in love with Klondike. You're a shrewd observer, Tom. Oh, I take notice. Of course, Doc. Feller like you would never fight for a woman against a sick man. Kind of looks now like Jim's going to get well. Did it occur to you that when he does get well, you have every right to try to win the girl? You're a good friend, Tom. Well, it's fair enough. May the best man win. Jim, you're awake. Doctor. Well, how do you feel? Jim, you're going to get well. Don't you recognize me? Jim, speak to me. Say something. Oh, Jim, try to talk. Say something. Oh, Doctor, he tried to talk, but he can't. This is something I don't understand. The part of the brain I operated on has nothing to do with the power of speech. Well, Judge, you're just fourteen dollars short. Fourteen? Mm-hmm. Great, and I've got. Well, I reckon, Klondike, you'll just have to take back those blankets over there. Yeah. You'll be needing all the blankets you've got. I'll just charge it to you. Well, now, thanks. I... I, uh, don't like to do that, but I'll be back. I'll be back next winter, and I'll have this boat just filled with nuggets. Big ones, too. Okay, Judge. Good luck to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Mark, it's Jim's bedtime. Why, he's in the kitchen. I'll reel
I'll take him in, Clondike. All right. Good night, Jim. I hope you sleep well. Fasten that door. Say, why is the doctor in such a hurry to get back to the States? Oh, it's about something that came over the radio last night. That Turner woman's been arrested and charged with murder. Who is she? Oh, she's Turner's wife. The man that the doctor operated on when he was down in the States before he came up here. If you remember, he died. Hmm. Yeah, that's mighty bad. Did you hear any more about it this afternoon? Uh-uh, not a word. Just some weather reports and news items and... You know, Doc, it'll be tough sledding tomorrow. But I'll get you through somehow. That is, if you feel you must go. Well, I... Well, why don't you stay a while? There must be some mistake. I know, but, but don't you see, to stay here would only look like I'm in hiding. I've got an idea. Yeah. We'll put your name on a shingle and hang it out on the porch, well, and that'll show them that you're not in hiding. Yes, I know, oh, but... Oh, come it... on. Well, I... Now, you stay here, and I'll get the stamping up. All right. Be a piece of board, board. Oh, here it is. Oh, that'll do. Now, easy, easy. Well, I guess I'll be turning in, folks. See you tomorrow morning. All right. Uh, good night, Tom. C-R-R-R. Ah, there. R-C-C-C-C. Oh, say, what about a period after the R? Oh, well, now, didn't you think I knew enough to put a period down there? Yeah, okay. Let me see. I guess we'd better have Robert. Bob wouldn't sound dignified. No, I'm right? afraid not. No, not for a doctor. I R. Where's the O? Oh, yes, please. Right. Jim's in bed, Blondike. All right, Mark. I'll turn out the light. That's R O B B. Here we are. Let me just see if you won't be clean. I'll take charge of the period. <laughs> C R R R R. Make yourself useful. You hand them to me. C R. You better kind of crowd this in a bit. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. M. M. Oh, dear. All right, get the E. I'll turn that upside down. You'll have the W. Oh, I kissed Tom, um, well, W. E, E, here it is, looking right at you. Oh, dear, this isn't very straight. Well, we can make a new one. L. L. What the heck happened to the L? There it is. Yeah, I'll let you finish. All right. Yeah, just about made it. A little bit crooked, but not bad. That's well, fine. Yeah, I hope you don't have to go. I don't want to go. Well, I guess we'd better hang it up anyway, huh? Yes, yes, I guess we better. We have a special news item about the sensational Turner case. Jane Turner, who was arrested yesterday, confessed to having conspired with Dr. Robert Cromwell to put her husband out of his misery by killing him. Although it has been believed that Dr. Cromwell was lost during an attempted flight to Tokyo, the authorities have learned that the flyers crashed in Alaska and that the doctor is there in hiding. We return you now to your local stations. It's a lie. Why, you couldn't have conspired to kill anyone. The Turner woman must have gone mad. I'll have to get back to the States as soon as possible. Well, how do they know that you're here? Not even the mail is gone now. Such things always leak through some way. I must leave the first thing in the morning. Right. 
I don't suppose we'll ever see each other again. If, if I had cured Jim, things might have been different. I could have told you then that I loved you, and you could have chosen between us. You know, Klondike, I've never loved another woman. You're the first, and I think you'll be the last. Goodbye, Klondike. Jim, what are you doing down here? What? Why? Why, you can walk. Here, let me see you. Why, you look fine. I can eyes. Yeah, yeah, I can walk. And I can talk, too. I've been doing a lot of talking lately over that microphone there. What? I don't understand. I wanted to get rid of you. Came near working, too. Tomorrow, you'd have been gone. You mean to tell me that, that you've been faking all this time? Sit down, and I'll explain it to you. Yeah, read that. No, uh, read it out loud. See if it doesn't sound familiar. We have a special news item about the sensational Turner case. Why, why that came over the radio tonight. Oh, no. You just thought it did. I broadcasted it over that microphone there. I cut it in on the loudspeaker upstairs. Of course, I disguised my voice. I used that switch right there. Simple enough. Oh, Jim, do you mean to tell me that you do it? There are only two ways of your getting Klondike. One was killing me. But you didn't dare do that. They'd have hung you for murder. The other was to cure me and then win her. So you cured me. It wasn't for me that you did it. It was so that you could take her away from me. I gave you fair warning to get out. I didn't give you enough juice that time to hurt you. Just a good jolt.
Nobody can hear us down here. They can't even hear this dynamo. But maybe I better tie this over your mouth. What say, Klondike? I said, is Dr. Cromwell up there? No. Well, I was sure I heard someone talking. It must have been the radio. It's been going all night. Better turn it off. All right. When they find you, I'll be in bed. Not able to walk. Not even able to talk. I'll get well gradually. They'll think you came down here to my workshop and accidentally electrocuted yourself. This is a better way of killing a man than operating on him, Doc. You like to experiment on people. Now I'm going to experiment on you. He's all right now, Mark. Both his body and his mind will soon be what they used to be. I'm as happy as you are, Mark. I'm happy too. Come in. I wouldn't believe it was broken, even if you showed me an x-ray. I want a story and I want to congratulate you. Oh, it was splendid the way you put it before the Medical Association. I was there, a triumph. Do you remember? It was exactly the way we spoke about it. And you did it. You proved it by that operation on Jim Armstrong. Do you know, Doctor, you're the first man I've ever known that came out of Alaska with fame rather than riches. You're wrong again. I came back with more riches than fame. Really? Yes. Yes? Oh, well, ask her to come in. Yes, Miss Porter? I found gold. Gold? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I just dropped in to see how you were. Come in, my dear. Pure gold, Miss Porter. I want you to meet her, Mrs. Cromwell. How do you do? How do you do? 
That gives me a lead for my story. And it starts like this. Gold, gold, precious gold. Hard to get. But not hard to hold. 